Travis, when you're evaluating big guys for this draft, how much do you put it in the context of what's happening in the NBA and you know all the switching teams do defensively and how those guys might fit, or do you just sort of look at it, you know, the individual prospect and what you might be able to do? With them? No, you have to take into account where the league's going. Um, you know, the league a few years ago, as you guys all know, they changed the rules where they really put an emphasis on not allowing contact on the perimeter, um, but you can still uh, or you're still allowed to be very physical in the post. And so it really kind of changed the way the game's played. Um, so we have to take that into account. When you look at big guys in today's game, they've got to be able to guard pick and rolls. If they can't guard pick and rolls, even if they're a tremendous offensive player, it puts your team at a huge disadvantage. So that's certainly a factor when we're evaluating all these big guys. And yet there's so many of them who seem to be, you know, at the top end of, of this draft. Does that reflect well on those particular players? or It means they're very athletic and move their feet. <laughs> Can you comment at all about, you know, what you're most looking for, what the team's most looking for, um, just positions to fill? Yeah, no, I've maintained all along, and I honestly believe this. Uh, we're going to take the best player. Uh, we're in a situation where we're looking to add the most talent we can, and we're going to get a good player at the third pick. Do you do draft scenarios where, okay, you know, player A is off the board. What if team, you know, two players yeah. No, that, that's basically all we're doing now is going through all the different scenarios that might happen. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit easier to do with the third pick than is the ninth pick, <laughs> pick, and when you get to three pick, it's a little harder. But uh, we're just in the process of trying to go through all those different scenarios and see who might be there. You mentioned uh, trading up. I know that there's possibilities to trade down, but as far as trading up, I would assume that you don't want to get rid of any of the assets that you built up as far as draft picks and young guys, or is that, is that play? No, I mean, listen, there's two times a year where you look at making moves, and that's a trade deadline, and then this time of year with the draft and free agency. So we're going through all those different scenarios, uh, trying to evaluate whether the players in this draft would be uh, players that we would value over you know, the assets we have stockpiled, uh, certainly looking at it the, through the other lens where we're going to look to see if the picks we have where we move back to collect more assets would be advantageous and you know all the hypotheticals that we talked about a minute ago th those are all the hypotheticals we're going through with uh, with it's kind of unique to have four picks in the top 34 do you anticipate that might break from a tradition of, of draft and stash type guy um, there's a few of those guys in the draft, as you're aware. A lot of them pulled out this year, but there's still, obviously still a few European guys out there. Um, we'll take a look at all those scenarios as well. Um, you know, one of the things you've seen in the past some is guys where you would draft them and they would either agree to go play on your G League team for a year or they go overseas for a year. Um, and those are all conversations that we'll have with guys. But as I've said from the beginning, certainly not scared of adding four rookies to our team next year. Uh, we have the roster spots for that. Um, so it's certainly an option as well. In evaluating the bigs in this class, how much of a consideration is it the way that they would potentially pair with John Collins? Uh, it's obviously a consideration, but I think with John, what he was able to prove last year is he can play both big spots. And when you look at all the big guys in this class with their athleticism and their length, um, I think the majority of these guys are going to be able to play both big spots as well. Travis, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Pierce was at Falcons practice yesterday with Dan Quinn. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Uh, if you are aware, do you know what they were kind of talking about? What was he trying to gain from uh, being a Falcons practice? Is, any kind of draft advice or you know, what was he up there kind of? Uh, no, it wasn't draft advice. He just wanted to go up there and kind of see how they run things. He came back and he was very impressed with uh, how quickly they go through their practices. Um, he just wanted to go up there and see how the NFL team does compared to the NBA team with their training camp stuff. With the new coach and just um, do, you, do you sense like the hype around Atlanta and around this, this draft and just with the new staff and everything? Uh, unfortunately, I don't get out a whole lot, um, but I, ho I hope there's hype out there. <laughs> um, with Lloyd, he has a, he's a defensive minded coach, obviously, and he has a way a system that he used in Philadelphia. He's, you know, he's talked at length about that. Keep that in mind as you, as you go through this draft. Uh, coach is involved with the process for certain. Um, and obviously, when you look at the best teams in the league, majority of the time they're good defensive teams, but at the end of the day, if you're not scoring 100 points, you're probably not winning. So, you know, we're going to look for guys that can, two way players can play defensively, but also we got to be able to score the ball on the other end. How's this, you know, been different for you having a top 
uh, high pick and, and being you know the GM as opposed to when you're in, in, in Golden State? Yeah, this is the highest pick that I've been a part of. Um, in Golden State, the highest pick we had was sixth. Um, so uh, it's exciting. Uh, having the four picks along with the third picks has we get a lot of phone calls, which is exciting as well. And we're going to go through all the different options presented to us and make the best decision, hopefully. How difficult is it to evaluate you know, these big guys who may not have had an opportunity to stretch the floor or to you know, be out on the perimeter offensively when you know that, you know, that, again, that is sort of where the NBA is going? How do you evaluate that potential? Well, a lot of them nowadays, especially when they get their name into the draft and they start working out, they, they do work on their three-point shot. I mean, these, these kids, all from the time that they're 12 years old, I mean, when you go watch a junior high game, the first thing kids do is run the three-point line. They don't start inside anymore. So most of these kids have that skill set. Um, everybody wants to play on their perimeter. When you have 19 and 20 year olds, how do you evaluate their career prospects for when they're 25 and 30 and how motivated they'll be? Uh, that's that's the hard part about this, right? It's trying to reject what an 18, 19 year old kid's going to be when he's 24, 25. And that's where, you know, taking these kids to dinner, interviewing them in Chicago, spending time with them here, trying to find out what motivates them and what they want out of their career. Um, I I'm, should have been a psychology major, but I wasn't. So I'm just <laughs> playing the amateur psychologists and all this. And how do you evaluate players that you didn't get to bring in for a workout or see at the combine? Um, so that's when the agent workouts come into play. You know, all the agencies now have their pro days, so we attend those. Um, in some situations, if we can't get a player in because you know they don't think we're going to take them three and they're going to be gone by 19, we'll we'll go out and watch them work out if they didn't have a pro day. Um, we just try to get our eyes in front of them as much as we can. But a lot of that has come if they played, you know, one year or two years, three years of college. You know, we've seen them multiple times in, and we, in the October, all through the college season, our scouts that go to practices. So, so they've been seen. It's hard to hide from us. As somebody who helped architect everything that, you know, Golden State has become now, is it almost faster to kind of build that kind of team with the copycat success and skill set? Now, I mean, a lot of these players in this draft this year have a lot of Steph Curry to their game or you know, like Draymond to the game. Is it almost faster to build a dynasty like that nowadays, in your opinion? Uh, well, I hope it's fast, but I, I don't. I don't necessarily anticipate it will be. I will say that uh, when I started in the front office in Golden State, uh, we're in a much better place with our salary cap structure and the picks that we have acquired. Um, but I've, I've said all along, listen, the exact the draft is not an exact process. Um, it takes a little bit of luck whether it was when we were able to get draft Steph Curry and Minnesota takes back-to-back -back point guards right in front of us. You know, we catch a lucky break there. Um, you know, Clay Thompson slipping to 11th, Draymond being there at 35. It, it takes a little bit of luck. All right. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Huh? Yeah. This way, yeah.